welcome to the Island of Snack podcast. I'm your host, Fabian Alafeld, and today we're joined by Dr. Allah Elvani. Allah is a recognized expert in the field of additive manufacturing, but he's also a key advisor in the realm of science and technology to the U.S. government. Allah is currently in D.C. as we speak, and he's serving as a science and technology fellow at the U.S. Department of Energy. Allah is also, and that's how we know each other, he's a professor at Texas A&M at the Department of Industrial and System Engineering. He has a lot of experience at, in, in additive manufacturing from that space as well. So in today's episode, we'll talk about Allah's experience with the DOE, the intersection of additive manufacturing and energy, and we'll also talk a bit about the future of smart manufacturing and digital manufacturing, to be specific. So let's get rolling. Allah, welcome to Additive Snack. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me, Fabian. Very glad to be here today. It's awesome to have you. And I want to start talking in, uh, briefly about your roles. What does the role of a fellow within the Department of Energy actually look like? And what type of projects are you currently working on? Yes, sure. Yes, currently I am privileged to be a part of a prestigious fellowship program sponsored by the American Association of, for the Advancement of Science, Yes. That's a competitive program that selects scientists and engineers from industry and academia, them with a unique opportunity to spend up to two years to actively shape policy at any of the three branches of the government, legislative, executive, or judicial. During my tenure with the government, I had the privilege of serving at the National Institute of Standards and Technology for one year, and I'm currently affiliated with the uh, U.S. Department of Energy Advanced Materials and Manufacturing Technologies Office. We call this DOE AMTO for two years. My experience as a fellow at the Department of Energy has been exceptionally rewarding. Okay. Uh, our office plays a pivotal role in defining the energy future of the United States. I'm privileged to contribute alongside my DOE AMTO team towards realizing our vision of cultivating a globally competitive advanced manufacturing sector and facilitating a clean decarbonized economy through advancements in materials and manufacturing technologies. And this aligns with our collective mission to shape a sustainable, innovative future. I'm sure we'll talk more about the specific activities that I'm fortunate to participate in the remainder of the podcast. But in general, I work on things like setting different strategic plans for, for, for advanced technologies. Mm -hmm. I also help administer and coordinate funding opportunity announcements. We invest in applied R&D. And I also participate a lot and engage in, in multiple interagency initiatives across the federal government that includes multiple agencies, not the DOE. Man. A lot of responsibilities, but also a lot of fun, I'm sure. You get to see and shape, as you said, the future of energy in that regard. Before we talk about the future, I want to jump into the now. And can you help us understand a little bit better what role does additive manufacturing play today in the energy sector? Yes, and very happy that you asked this question, Fabian, because when delving into discussions about additive manufacturing, the immediate associations often gravitate towards aerospace and aviation and biomedical industries. Yeah. Now, this is, of course, true. These are great. These are, these are sectors that have really made very good use of. However, it's also essential to recognize that it plays a pivotal role in the energy sector as well. It's less obvious. The conventional merits of additive manufacturing, such as light weighting for enhanced fuel efficiency in aviation, for example, are well known. But. Again, the impact of additive extends far beyond this, this limited realm. So in the energy sector, additive manufacturing emerges as a very strong contender for producing components with vastly improved properties in clean energy systems, okay. like wind turbines and nuclear reactors, for example. So think about large scale components. I'm talking here components exceeding 10 tons of weight. That's a testament to the scalability and versatility of additive manufacturing technologies, right? So yeah. a lot of applications for additive manufacturing in clean energy generation. Also take, for instance, the application of additive manufacturing in designing and processing materials tailored for hard surface conditions, a common, which is a very common feature in, min, in many clean energy generation applications. Geothermal energy, for example, with its unique challenges, stands out as a prime example of additive manufacturing to address such demanding conditions underscores its significance in advancing clean energy solutions, not just in 
defense and 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 airspace and medical implants, which again are all very important, but uh, but there is more. It's also worth mentioning that one of the prime institutes, national institutes that conduct basic and applied research in metal additive manufacturing, is the manufacturing demonstration facility at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which mm-hmm. is sponsored by our office DOEM too. So that's a high level overview of additive manufacturing for energy today. Yeah, thank you. And I think it's it's also worth mentioning, we recently had, actually twice already, had somebody from Siemens Energy on this podcast. And what's still stuck in my head is what Marcus from Siemens mentioned to me. And he said, Siemens Energy has reached a point of no return when it comes to additive manufacturing, meaning that the components that they're producing additively for their gas turbines can only be produced additively, meaning going back to conventional is not even an option. It is part of, of the future and gas turbine, that it is, if I'm not mistaken, it is also key to accelerate the adoption of uh, clean energy sources for gas turbines and improve the efficiency of gas turbines when it comes to injection, when it comes to also certain aesthetic turbine components. Is that something that you also see or have seen in your work? Absolutely. Whether it's Siemens or some of our other, some of the other companies that make use of our technology that we support, like GE, for example, all these manufacturers of clean energy systems, like you very accurately mentioned, there is no way, there is no way, they don't want to go back because they did the right thing. They yeah. conducted good design for additive manufacturing and they, and they conducted good development of materials specifically for additive manufacturing. So they managed to unlock its opportunities rather than adapting materials from conventional processes. They, they did the right thing. So they unlocked the opportunity with additive and then they can't move back because there's just too many benefits. Yes, I have seen a lot of these examples in the work that we do and in our partners. That's awesome. And you do mention materials a lot and you also have a material science background and a really strong interest and experience in material science. Let's talk about that a little bit because especially in the energy sector, the material requirements and environments are very harsh. You have a high cost of failure. So what are some of the materials that are being leveraged today in additive? And what are some gaps that we have to overcome to get us to new alloys or new characterizations that can help us to overcome some of these gaps? Yeah, so within the realm of additive manufacturing materials, specifically for the energy sector, of course, we often encounter the usual suspects, commercial alloys like 316 and in Canel and 64 and you know it. However, the landscape has also significantly evolved beyond these conventional choices. I call them conventional because these are the commercial materials that started with the additive revival in, in the couple last decades. The landscape has evolved, uh, encompassing a fascinating array of advanced materials that hold immense potential when harnessed through additive manufacturing. If I were to give an example, I think of uh, refractory alloys, for example, mm. as high, high entropy alloys is another example. These are very complex, very advanced materials. It takes a lot to just design a material, let alone process it. And additive helps you not just with manufacturing critical complex components from this. It also, it even helps you in designing the right material because the exploration space is vast. Mm-hmm. So it's a great tool to not only manufacture but also design these materials. And of course, when you do the job correctly, then you have endless opportunities. So uh, if a a refractory alloys and high temperature alloys is one very specific uh, material class that uh, that has high relevance to to energy applications. Of course, there are other battery materials, but maybe we'll get a chance to talk about this in the remainder of the podcast as well. Do you have an example for, for a specific material and application? that is being unlocked by additive and a specific alloy? Let me think. Tungsten alloys, for example, is tungsten, whether it's pure tungsten or, or, or high entropy alloys that involve tungsten are some very good examples. I do not have specific components of the top of my head that I'm allowed to share because many of these are for supporting our nuclear energy research. Mm-hmm. But I can mm-hmm. tell you that many of the components in the nuclear reactors used for generating clean electricity They're using nuclear energy come in these alloys. Okay, very interesting. Yeah, actually, we will have Westinghouse on the podcast pretty soon. 
They will talk about a few applications in the nuclear fission space. And we recently also had, last year we had TAE, so a nuclear fusion company mm -hmm. that also had some interesting applications. So a lot to come in the nuclear space, which yes. is definitely overdue. You also mentioned in your introduction, supply chain security and ensuring that the energy sector, especially in the United States, but also in other countries like Europe, where we do still have a bit of a shaky supply chain security when it comes to energy, mm -hmm. needs to be secured. What role does additive manufacturing play or can additive manufacturing play a role in, in, in that security? Oh, a foundational role in enhancing supply chain security through increasing the resilience of the, that's the key word over here, supply chain resilience. Additive has a foundational role in increasing the resilience of the supply chain, particularly in the face of unexpected shocks, like mm -hmm. pandemics, natural disaster, geopolitical factors. So, and the audience probably already know the inherent strength of additive lies in its ability to produce parts on demand when needed, where needed, with constraints, of course. Now, if I were to narrow the focus to energy supply chain in specific, Here's a clear example. Many clean energy generation systems now rely on these large scale metallic parts that weigh 10 tons or more. I, I mentioned this in one of the previous questions. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, the U.S. manufacturers of such systems, such as Siemens and General Electric, often find themselves with zero options for sourcing such critical components domestically in the U.S. And, I, and I'm not saying very little options. I'm talking zero options for some of them because the forging and casting sectors have, have heavily outsourced in the last, in the past 30 years. Yeah. So to emphasize the significance of this potential transformation, last year we indeed launched a congressionally directed $30 million funding opportunity, specifically calling for the development of new manufacturing technologies, additive, tailored to address these supply chain challenges within the energy sector. Several projects have already kicked off in, in recent weeks for their support for other innovative projects under this announcement. Now, the nice thing about, about this, Fabian, is that it doesn't only serve the energy supply chain. Of course, exactly. our work is meant to, to increase the resilience of energy supply chains, but it cuts across multiple sectors that need such large-scale components. There's an urgent need for alternative solutions to produce these large-scale components and additive technologies such as powder bath but also wire feed and friction stir welding and emerge as very viable options. That's really good to hear that there's a lot of work being done in that space. I just gave a little lecture at the MIT on Monday, and we talked about the manufacturing sector as a whole, right? And in the 50s and 60s at its max, 27% of the U.S. GDP was attributed to the manufacturing sector. Today, we're at 11%, right? Because as you said, we outsource a lot of the manufacturing into into other countries and we paid the price for it especially during covid and in the recent supply chain challenges that we yes. experienced so pulling it back well, well, through advanced manufacturing is 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 the way to absolutely and the good news is that the us is aware of that is aware of consequences of all this outsourcing that happened and they're working to reverse it so there's really there's a very strong push i would say since 2008 to bring advanced manufacturing not just manufacturing advanced manufacturing back to the U.S. to regain global competitiveness. Of course, it takes time and effort and investments, but uh, you see this year, last year, you've had largest, the largest legislation with the largest investment in R&D for advanced manufacturing in history. Yeah. So you, th this tells you that we are, we're working to solve this problem. That is really good to hear. It's really awesome to be, to be a part of that transition. Let's transition speaking of transition, a bit about <laughs> into the future of, of energy. What I think is very interesting, and most people read about it, is that especially in Texas, energy storage and uh, grid stability is, is a huge topic. Battery manufacturing is becoming more and more, not only of a challenge, but also of a, of a matter of of, of providing people with, with electric vehicles. There's, there's, I think, also an expectation of a shortage in transistors due to a increased energy demands, not only from transitioning into electric heating for households, but also, obviously, the huge energy demand that artificial intelligence and GPUs are pulling. If we look at energy storage and battery manufacturing, which also both of these technologies want to pull into the United States, 
I think the recent cuts in in subsidizing electric vehicles that don't leverage U.S. manufacturing for certain battery components is a test of that. What role can additive manufacturing play in these mm -hmm. next gen energy technologies and battery and energy storage technologies? Oh my, that's a tough one. Not because I don't know, but rather because there's so much innovation going on in additive manufacturing for these specific areas. If I were to list some examples, we have the following. So using additive manufacturing to create customized electrode structures for batteries mm -hmm. that are now necessary with recent trends towards vehicle electrification, Teslas and whatnot. Additive manufacturing has also been utilized to produce solid state battery components, such as electrolytes and separators. This aims to improve the safety and the energy density of batteries, eliminating liquid the electrolytes and, and enabling precise control over the complex geometries required for these components. Of course, whenever we say complex geometries, we're thinking additive. The versatility of additive manufacturing also allows for the exploration of new advanced materials, like I mentioned earlier, with enhanced properties specifically for battery applications such as advanced composites, nanomaterials, and hybrid materials incorporated into battery components. Now, if I may, you mentioned semiconductors, and I want to make a very important point. So the U.S. has, it has always been the place for innovation. And yeah. even when we, so what happened with semiconductors is that we invented them. We came up with the original innovation and we were leaders in manufacturing. Then we gave up the manufacturing leadership for semiconductors but we still have the innovation and know-how for innovation. So we're always pursuing the, the next thing. So we're like we develop the innovation and then some other countries take them and may even surpass us because we're working on the future. Semiconductors specifically, I'll tell you, for example, the manufacturing, the metal additive manufacturing of not of the electronics themselves, but of the components of capital equipment that will be used to produce these semiconductors, the fabs, that is a big area that we have very high interest in. And I know <laughs> we, I just wrote an article on this with my good friend, Dr. Ahmed al from from, from Vico. And uh, so that's one very good aspect. Now, and of course, we have the 3D printing or additive manufacturing of the electronics components themselves. That's probably not part of that fusion. There are some other material extrusion and inkjet and direct ink write uh, proxies that are dedicated for this. So, so yes, the additive manufacturing definitely has a role in shaping the future. And in the U.S., we are, we are used to doing this. Like we pave the, we trail blazers for coming up with the new innovation. And then eventually the rest of the world picks up and given their cost advantage and, and other advantages, they might surpass us, like what happened with semiconductor manufacturing, mm -hmm. but the innovation still happens here. That's very interesting. Yeah. It seems like we're moving towards a future where almost every component we touch has at least been touched by an additively manufactured device, whether if it's printed directly or certain tools or capital equipment components, as you mentioned, that have been printed yeah. for various reasons. Speaking about the manufacturing, also at scale, you are heavily engaged in looking into smart and digital manufacturing technologies. And obviously additive is just a part here. We have to look at whole factory floors. We have to look at additive manufacturing being one tool in the tool belt of manufacturers. But uh, beyond adding sensors, which I think most people just think about when hearing smart manufacturing or IoT, what interesting projects are out there and what's your vision of an integrated manufacturing, digital manufacturing chain? So happy that you alluded to that point regarding the, uh, some uh, limited scope by, by, by some. So when we talk about smart manufacturing, I agree and I think it's essential to transcend the conventional notion of just installing a bunch of sensors on 3D printers and analyzing data for defect detection. Of course, this is undeniably crucial. By no means am I understating the importance of doing, but the contemporary shift towards smart manuf and digital manufacturing demands a much more expansive viewpoint. So take additive manufacturing as an example of smart manufacturing technology. We must focus on aspects such as digital twins, for example. We've been talking about digital twins for a while. Some people have been doing research, but it's very far from where it needs to be. Yeah. Uh, data sharing standards are very important, especially considering the massive and diverse 
data stream generated by various users these days in additive in the additive world. Even within the specific domain of defect detection using sensors, by the way, we need to move beyond what the community has been focusing on for the past decade, like thermal imaging and powder laying monitoring. Again, these are important, but it's time to address more broad questions like what data modalities do we need to consider? What do we need to measure? How do we fuse heterogeneous data from different sources to come up with good decisions? What predictive machine learning algorithms should we use to address data privacy constraints, for example? See, all, mm. these are all very subtle points under smart manufacturing need to be considered. How do we ensure meeting cybersecurity requirements and what are the needed standards and how do we develop these standards? When we talk about smart manufacturing, you asked me for, for an example. I do direct the audience to the publicly available digital factory project at the Oak Ridge Manufacturing Demonstration Facility. Okay. That's a classical example of, 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 of how additive manufacturing serves the digital transformation in manufacturing with sensors and data being an, a component of it, but also with cloud computing and data sharing and other important aspects of smart manufacturing being considered. An often overlooked facet in the integration uh, is the integration of automation and robotics, by the way. This is equally vital for enhancing overall equipment efficiency and everything, but it's even more critical when contemplating scenarios like traditional man additive manufacturing at the point of use, or even niche areas such as in-space additive manufacturing. So the integration of automation, of autom automation and the robotics in the context of additive manufacturing, th that, that's an un unexplored field, or it has been explored, of course, but it needs much work. Yes. Yeah, it definitely needs needs work. I think today we're in this in-between phase where we're almost ready, where automation can have a very significant impact to productivity, but we also have a still a limited amount of organizations that have 10, 20, 50 plus machines where automation can have that huge impact where the capital equipment investment is justified. But we're very quickly moving into that direction. And I think the industry is heavily looking into it. And we just need to, to get over that last hump in order to, to really start leveraging those technologies. And just to add one more buzzword to, <laughs> to this mix, we talked about digital twins. We talked about IoT. Let's talk about AI for a second, because it is undeniably has found its way not only into industry, but especially into consumers, not only large language models, but also obviously machine learning can play a very interesting role in, in solving some of these challenges that you just mentioned, right? Monitoring data is quite large and correlating monitoring data with testing data with CTs data is quite the complex mm -hmm. feat. Are you looking into AI and machine learning to improve the efficiency of equipment, the reliability of equipment, reducing cost per part in additive manufacturing? What impacts will AI have from your perspective? Absolutely. We're doing what you just described and more. So AI and machine learning obviously are pivotal components of smart manufacturing that we're discussing right now. However, to talk about their specific applications in additive, there are certainly specific benefits that are achievable, but I strongly emphasize that it's imperative to approach AI and machine learning in additive with a balanced perspective, their capabilities for a real application that transcend the overhype and fosters accessibility across the industry. I do not want us to make a similar mistake to what some people in the additive community did 20 years ago when they promised too much. AI and machine learning definitely, definitely have very strong uh, applications. So beyond the well-known applications like predictive models for the detection, there is a vast landscape of possibilities. For instance, harnessing the power of machine learning and materials informatics allows us to design new class of materials, like I said previously tailored explicitly for additive manufacturing mm -hmm. in contrast to using existing materials. Another key aspect is the strategic use of machine learning for process optimization. Democratizing access to these tools is, cru is crucial in my opinion, whether through open source initiatives or commercially available solutions, such that not only employees of, of very large corporations or government labs can use them, but also users in smaller shops and service bureaus is very important. So yeah, we do use AI and machine learning in a lot of things related to additive, not just defect detection. And again, I, I will have to cite back the digital factory example from Oak Ridge. If I were to add one last thing, Sabian, 
Mm-hmm. I think one of the problems we have with smart manufacturing this is very similar to what we had with additive in 2009. It's not defined. You remember at th- 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 that time, th- 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 it, it had not even been called additive manufacturing yet. Some people were calling it sterilithography. Some people were calling it laser rapid tintering, prototyping. Yeah. rapid prototyping, the, the form fabrication. And then when things started to be, when the terminology at least started to become standardized, this enabled a very huge push because people knew what they were talking about. And then followed by road mapping activities for identifying technology barriers and research needs. This is precisely what we're doing now at DOE. So we are leading in partnership with the National Academies. We are putting together terminologies and a national strategy on smart manufacturing for the national level, not just for the Department of Energy. Mm-hmm. to uh, to address such uh, challenges. I think that's a very important point that we need to start with because right now, think of it, people are talking, oh, smart manufacturing, cyber manufacturing, industry 4.0, uh, digital manufacturing. What's the difference between these? I think when these differences are delineated and elucidated, a huge progress is going to be achieved. Yeah, and it helps to get over the hype and over the marketing messages. Absolutely. I think in the past, especially in the additive space, if we talked about smart or automated manufacturing, it, it was more marketing than, than and not only because it's not because it's not possible. I think robotics in a way are way further along in their maturity curve than than additive manufacturing, right? Because we've been using robotics since the eighties in, in zero manufacturing of, of automotive vehicles. Right? Really? So we know what we're doing in that space. I think it's combining those two technologies in a economically viable production that is a challenge still today. And the work that you're doing to help not only streamline the terminology, but also streamline the impact and identifying the fields where it can truly add value, I think is highly necessary to not end up in an overhyped curve where the disappointment exactly. is quite big afterwards. Yeah, I'm okay with hypes. I'm not okay with overhypes. Overhype, there's nothing wrong with sales pitches and marketing. People need to do that. But I think people damage new technologies when they oversell its capabilities and promise too much. Yeah, if you hype it, you got to follow through. <laughs> That's the Kirks, yeah. Exactly. Thankfully, we passed this this stage with additive and we're good now. But I don't want the same to happen with smart manufacturing. Exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. It is, I think, also very important to mention, especially in the space of, of, of energy, but also other other sectors, that the role of the government is quite crucial in, in mm-hmm. helping additive or really any new technology to, to be adopted. It's a balance of over-regulation versus, versus supports that always needs to be found. But what role do you see of the U.S. government, but even ultimately other governments in Mm -hmm. and fostering the adoption and the impact of additive manufacturing in various sectors. Yes, no, no, no. I I, I fully understand the question. I actually agree with it. So there are multifaceted roles that government, the U.S. government included, should and indeed is undertaking. Some of the more obvious strategies obviously are investment investing in research, coming up with legislations that 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 invest in R and D. And however. Beyond those obvious initiatives, there are equally impactful but less overt actions that I have witnessed during my tenure in government service. So one such action is the cultivation of talent pipelines through through strategic investment in education and workforce development programs with a keen eye on promoting diversity and equity in the, in, in the next generation workforce. Simultaneously, if I were to think of other actions that governments in the general sense should do, Providing robust support to small and medium manufacturers. These constitute, by the way, 98% of the U.S. manufacturing landscape, but often grapple with the notable barriers when it comes to adopting new technologies. Mm -hmm. So this is where instruments like instrumental offices like DOE AMTO and programs such as SBIR and STTR um, and the Manufacturing Extension Chip Program and even think of the AM Forward program that was issued, that was launched last year. So acknowledging the vital role played by these entities, it's crucial to emphasize that the government's pivotal role as a convener and thought leader within the innovation ecosystem is very important as well. This is really one of the most important roles, in my opinion, that we play at DOEM to and in the federal government in general. We bring together experts 
we provide a convening space for them where we bring experts from industry and academia and government and we facilitate the identification, the co-identification of critical technologies, the development of strategic plans for high priority technology areas, strengthening the manufacturing supply chain and whatnot. Notable, exam notable examples of these include the National Science and Technology Council, for example. We have a subcommittee on advanced manufacturing okay. and it assumes a central role in this regard. And of course, specific offices like DOE AMTO and Manufacturing USA. So the, the, this convening role of the federal government is not to be understated. Of course, it's important for us, for the government to invest in R&D and to assign a part of the of a country's budget towards R&D. No, no one would, would disagree with that. But this convening role is important because think of it, th there's, there are very little ways for a large company like GE or Siemens, I don't want to be mentioning too many names, to interface with researchers at universities and to interface with the smaller service bureaus in, in state X or state Y. This convening role through mechanisms like public-private partnerships, for example, some people might be a little skeptical of them, but they, they achieve more impact than what people think. So this is my summary. Yeah, that's a really good point, especially about the small, medium enterprises. I think for the for a large organization that can take a risk in investing exactly. in new technologies, it's it's a bit easier. But for a small, medium enterprise, sometimes and oftentimes family owned, it's a big risk to to get into a new technology, educating and or hiring an expert in that space. Do you have any advice for let's say a small casting house or a a machine shop that, that believes that additive could be a, an interesting business generator for them, but is a bit struggling in um, taking that last step into the technology. Are there certain resources, government, governmental support structures that they can rely on? Of course. So the most straightforward thing for them to rely on is what we call the Manufacturing Extension, thing, Manufacturing Extension Partnership, MEP. Just Google MEP. And there is one MEP center in each of the 50 states that helps uh, put, put SMEs, small medium manufacturers on the path to if they are struggling with, with, with adopting a new technologies or need to de-risk it. That's one mechanism. Another mechanism, there are many other mechanisms. I think they should start with trying to spend a couple of days trying to identify relevant programs. So for example, if we talk about Oak Ridge Manufacturing Demonstration Facility, it's called Manufacturing Demonstration for a reason. This, and this facility is dedicated for companies to come and say, hey, I'm a small manufacturer. I'm really interested in powder bed fusion, but I'm hesitant to buy $600,000 machine in my small shop. Can you help me with this? Then we have the facilities to help them demonstrate how this technology would be of use to them and even sometimes help provide training for them. So that's, so we talked about MEP, we talked about things like manufacturing demonstration facility, and of course, reaching out to manufacturing USA institutes might appear very straightforward, but I've been surprised by the amount of um, people from small medium manufacturers that did not know of its existence. They have workforce development programs, very low cost, sometimes no cost. And they have help with commercialization, with all aspects of commercializations, technical or legal. So they should spend a couple of days, just go do a Google search about government support for small manufacturers. They will find a list of five or six programs. The three that I mentioned are some of them. And just send an email to them. They are very perceptive. I will tell you, Fabian, there is a lot of untapped opportunity that the federal government provides that small and medium manufacturers should be making use of because we know their importance. We know that our vision for a global, for a globally competitive advanced manufacturing sector in the U.S. will not happen without supporting these small and medium manufacturers. That is really good advice. I'll follow up with you to make sure we put those resources into the show notes of the podcast. And also maybe we as U.S. and other machine manufacturers and players in the field can point people into the right direction during conversations. I'll be very happy to do that. Perfect. Allah, this has been a really insightful episode. Thank you so much for jumping on the show with us, for sharing your expertise and experience. It was very insightful. And I hope that people out there today not only got a better understanding of the energy sector and the future role of additive in that space, but also, I think, a motivational push 
to to get into the technology or to expand their their presence in the technology. I think the media and additive has recently been a bit negative, but I think unrightfully so for many organizations. And your conversation today really, I think, showed the dominance and the true impact that the technology can have. So thank you so much for being on the show with us today. Thank you very much, Fabian. So thanks for having me, but more importantly, thanks for having this series, The Additive Snack, which is what I expect from Additive Minds and EOS trying to really foster innovation in the community at large. That's very important. I am not threatened by the, uh, by, the, by the recent occasional negative media coverage of some additive occurrences, because I think that's the natural stage. Right? There, there was a hype, some people adopted. So, that, so additive is not going anywhere. Additive is here to stay. It's just that some companies will struggle and hopefully they'll find out a way to, to get out of their struggle. But I believe in additive. It has already been proven. I think we're past this stage. Thank you very much for having me, Fabian. And I very much look forward to the next Additive Snack podcast after this one. Yeah, same here. We'll have some really cool guests coming up as well. And I'm sure we'll have you on the show in the future. I think pretty soon you're going back to, to College Station to teach at Texas A&M. You yes. have a lot of additive equipment down there as well. So I'm sure we'll see a lot of research and very interesting projects coming out of, out of that department. Yeah, I hope people come to visit me in Texas A&M and see our beautiful US M290. I don't know, uh, maybe I'm not allowed to say that on the podcast, but I'm very proud of that piece of equipment. I look forward to having visitors see our, our facilities. Yeah, awesome. All right, to our listeners, thanks for, for being with us today. I hope this episode did give you a deeper insight into the energy sector, but also into some of the future developments that we're seeing in, in energy, but also coming out of the, the U.S. government. Don't forget to subscribe to the Out of Sight podcast. Share it with your friends and colleagues if you thought this episode was interesting. And I'll see you next time.